against someone from some other state that you know they were kind of ranked or something. Um, but now, now um, U of H is number six in the country. <laughs> for an awesome football team and high rankings is an awesome IT security program. <laughs> from the University of Texas San Antonio, and a degree in electrical engineering specializing in space systems engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He holds, now, this is where you pull out your bingo cards, and he has Security Plus, CISSP, CSSLP, CRISC, DFCP, GIC, SP, CASP, and CDP certifications. So anyone that got all of those, I think you may be missing Z or something, but <laughs> all of the letters of the alphabet. As an ISSA fellow, he's also a senior member of ASQ, IEEE, and ACM. His research interests include the use of systems theory to explore information security, specifically in cyber, physical systems, and critical infrastructures. He has co-authored six security books, Bonus points to anyone that's actually read all six of them. And numerous academic articles associated with information security. He is active in the NSA DHS Centers of Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense Education Program, creating the center at the University of Houston. He is a steering committee member of the DHS-sponsored Industrial Control, Control Systems Joint Working Group, a group associated with workforce development and cybersecurity aspects of industrial control systems. He has an extensive background in secure coding and is a former co-chair of the Homeland Security Department of Defense Software Assurance Forum Working Group for Workforce Education, Training, and Development. Recently, he addressed the Presidential Commission on Cybersecurity and the Texas House Committee on Urban Affairs. And we are fortunate enough that with all this expertise, he can still talk to normal people like us. And tonight, he will tell us why critical infrastructure is not just another IT system. So without further ado, I introduce Dr. R. Carr. Okay? 
And the real problem is evolved to the point in today's major networks, you have too many conversations, too many different protocols, that if you ever wanted to go in and look for bad packets, one of the mistakes we made when we invented TCP and IP and all these things is that we didn't put an evil packet flag. Because if we had the evil packet flag, then all bad traffic could set the flag, we could sort it, it'd be good. And by the way, all this, the whole purpose behind all this stuff is so that we can view cats. <laughs> okay? And videos. And this is how we built our systems. Okay? And if one of these is yours, please don't self-identify. <laughs> so then along, if we built IT systems before we decided about security. Actually, it's not true. Government, NSA, actually predecessor to NSA in this case, but they've been playing in the security field since the 70s, the early 70s. Once we started computing things, we actually built secure operating systems called Multics. And they're still around, they don't do anything because they only did one thing in today's world. If you only can do one thing, you know, it's called Blackberry. <laughs> um, so we invented security a long time ago. And I told my students to read a paper by Salter and Schroeder, and I think everybody's probably read it. If they haven't, you should go look it up. It defined security in 1974. And those same principles still work today. But we ignore them all the time. And we dumped it down to, oh, well, it's just about confidentiality, integrity, availability. And somehow we have to manage those elements based on different data types. Some things they want to keep secret, some things they don't want you to change, you know, etc. At the end of the day, we measure our success by basically separating authorized and unauthorized parties through access control. You're either allowed to do something or aren't. And we've been doing this for decades. Oh, yeah, badly. Because, well, what's it look like? Well, NBC headlines lately about the cybersecurity failure, breaches, what's it mean to you? Lots of paperwork, if they're not regulatory exemptions, things like that. But in the IT world, have we ever lost an executive from having an email server crash? I mean, they may feel that their life has come to an end, but mm, it's different. This is what it looks like, okay? I was gonna put a picture of Delta, um, but I really felt bad about just putting a lot of planes around a terminal, okay? Doesn't even leave terminal areas. So this is what happens when you get IT wrong, by and large. And I think most of us have seen these pictures, and it's part of our culture now to be used to this. So let's look at this OT thing now. So that's IT. We've all lived it. If you haven't, well, keep networking. But let's talk about OT. A lot of people look at OT as just IT in a different place. But it's really a way, way different world. It has been around as long as IT. We have mixed hardware and software together to provide solutions so that physical devices can talk to each other, compute, do these things, and change our world. So this has been around, matter of fact, they actually ran early OT systems on mainframes. Okay, now just realize that early mainframes were less powerful than even the older generation of cell phones, but. <clears throat> the bottom line though is they built their own protocols, they built their own system, they've been doing this for the same number of decades. But let's look at how they're different. What happens when you have a bad OT day? What does it mean if I'm an OT and I have a bad day? Well, I have things like this, okay? This was what happened when I ran some production code, or actually development code, testing code in production one day, and they never did explain why, but yeah, it blew up a pipeline, killed some people, et cetera. Texas City, those of us that live here, you go look at the chemical safety board's interpretation of it, this is a very bad day, okay? Moscow, Russia. I don't know if I can make this one work or not. Let's see. No, I gotta figure out how to auto start. How do I make the video play? Hmm. Hmm. 
That's interesting. You have internet? Yeah. No, it's in the it's in the slide deck. Oh, can I see people here? Okay, this is the back of the box. It should click in the box. <laughs> yes, I did once, but I must have missed. This is OT having a less than stellar day. Okay? Now, how often does this stuff happen? A 30 inch gas main this last week had a little problem in New Mexico, and a family was camping a couple miles away. Was is the operable word. Okay? When you let liquids or gases out of pipelines, um, bad things can happen very quickly. So, I think we can all agree security is about risk management. We can use all the fancy words we want, but the question becomes, what's my risk? And a lot of times security professionals lose track of that first thing and they say, well, security is about getting the right controls in place. If I have the right controls and can show you an audit to the right controls and compliance, Okay, when the pipeline loads up, people will come by to look at your last audit report. They'll come by to look and find out what didn't work. They could care less if you pass the last audit. Okay, they really don't care. Um, so the bottom line at the end of the day is, what actions do we need to take to manage the risk? So how is OT different from IT in respect of risk and managing that? Well, in IT security, everything's about the data. Everything becomes about confidentiality, integrity, availability, not confidentiality, confidentiality. Mm, I was drinking last night when I made these, I guess. <laughs> so, and so we, we talk about this all the time, and students in the room that have have heard me say this, the secure IT systems, one does what it's supposed to do, only what it's supposed to do, with respect to CIA. If it, does other things, well that's generally bad, but as long as it keeps our data confidential when it's supposed to, or integrity when it's supposed to, and it's available when it's supposed to, we're okay with that, generally. In OT, we define security as safe operation of the system. Okay? I really don't care about some of this other stuff. I care about, is the system going to operate safely? And is it going to operate within the bounds of operation that we define for it? Because when we talk physical systems, okay, let's look at a tram in Poland recently. I guess it's been about three or four years ago. Kid got on the internet and thought it was a simulator, and he controlled the light rail. Yeah. What happens when you put two trains going opposite directions on the same piece of track? Well, it all depends on if they're closing or going further apart. In this case, unfortunately, they were closing. And they hit each other. Okay? And why? He, the 14 year old kid thought he was playing the simulation. He had no idea that he was playing with the downtown light rail. Do not do that with light rail around us, please. It goes right past university. And, you know, I want those revenue producing units, I mean, students to continue <laughs> in their studies. So, in the OT world, I don't care about authorized users. Matter of fact, one of the things you'll learn real quickly in the OT world is we don't have access control. Because the vast majority of devices that we're going to be talking to don't have a means for access control. And then you get the IT guy coming up, well, we need an 8 character, a 12 character password, changes this off, and every user has to have a different password. It's like, excuse me, no, the guy sitting in the seat is the guy in charge. He doesn't need a password. Well, no, no, no. When you change shifts, you need to log in and out. No, we never log in or out. We don't turn the machine off ever. Okay? This guy sitting in the seat. And think about this. <clears throat> Can you hurry up and fix those control rods? We're three minutes from Meltdown. I'm sorry. I can't remember the password. They keep looking it up. I'm trying three old ones. It's just not working. Locked out? What do you mean I'm locked out? They don't play that game in OT. The equipment's not designed for it, the systems aren't designed for it, and until we came up with this really cool idea of connecting everything with the internet, we didn't need it. So I don't care who sees the data, because it doesn't really matter. What matters is the right data gets to the right place. 
I don't care about user credentials. So where we worry about in the real world, I get Dr. Conklin's user credentials, I get on the UT's viewing system and can go do all these cool things. First of all, you'll find being a professor doesn't give you access to a lot of cool things. You need to be someone like Mary Dickerson, who's in charge of security. She gets even less cool stuff. <laughs> Although email from the boss, that's probably about it. So are user credentials, are they powerful? Well, actually, yes, they are. Because you use my user credentials to get somebody else's user credentials to get somebody else's user credentials. But in the OT world, since we're not using them, what are you going to use them to get? The operator sitting at the HMI station didn't log in. Sure, three years ago when we started it, last time we had a plant shut down, we actually you know, logged into the machine and started running. But that account doesn't have anybody to talk to, so I don't really care. We live in the OT world under the following guise. If it worked yesterday and it works today, how do I make it work tomorrow? We're going to change nothing. Now, <clears throat> if I change anything, if I patch a system, how do I know it's still reliable? How do I know it's still going to work? When we bring a manufacturing plant, say a, a major refinery, up from cold status, like after Hurricane Ike, so they took them down, shut them down, use that time for maintenance, then you turn it back on. How do you turn it back on? You turn it on to 10%. And you have people run around everywhere and check everything. And after a couple days, where everybody's working, by the way, there's none of this regular work shifts. You work 12 hour days, okay? You get 12 hours off, 12 hours on, seven days a week. Then after a few days, it's like, okay, it's working good at 10%, let's take it to 20. Or if you're bold, 25. Run a few more days. Anything hiccups, you solve the hiccup. You might decide to go back. It can take two weeks to start one of these large behemoths, okay? So I can shut it down as a hacker in minutes, and it takes you two weeks to start it back up. I can shut it down by running an Nmap scan in the wrong, if you use Nmap improperly configured on a control system, you can brick a controller. Now suddenly the plant suddenly goes, oh no, safety system shut down. How do you explain to your CEO that one of your producing assets, a major plant, isn't working for the next two weeks while you restart it. Because one of your people decide to run a scan. So we don't change anything. Because it takes too long to validate changes. Any change. So if you patch something, you really literally have to take the system back 10% and make certain it still works at 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Eventually you get back to 100. To summarize this in a simple little table, there are things that we do that are differently in the OT world. For instance, my favorite one is we run 24 by 7 by 365 by forever. There are no maintenance windows. You don't take things down. They run all the time. Okay? Let's look at the electric system. How would we feel if we got a notice from center point saying, your monthly maintenance window this year, this month, will be on you know September 19th from 2 to 3 a.m. Electricity temporarily unavailable while we upgrade our systems. Okay, I'm being serious. Do we see those notes from IT on our IT systems? Yeah. Email will be down between these hours. Database will be down. People saw SAP. Your water. You didn't really want water next Sunday. <laughs> at 2 a.m. in the morning, did you? Because it's a maintenance window. So our systems really do run 24 by 7, by 365, by forever. Now, when I say by forever, I have still seen, and I will never out clear, NT40, I've seen that in the last year, in a plant. Running fine. Matter of fact, it's running so well, that the company has a whole stack of boxes that will run on, because you can't go to Best Buy and buy an MT40 box. <laughs> okay? So when this company put it in place, they bought a forever supply of white box PCs, in essence, all configured exactly the same, and when one wears out, they just swap it with another one. And they keep the software. Why? 
Because the software running on top of the NT40 was written in the early 90s, and that vendor doesn't exist anymore, and there's no upgrade path, but they're not going to go pay somebody to re-engineer and rebuild a system that was working great yesterday, and the yesterday before, and the yesterday before that, because their process hasn't changed. So bottom line, our equipment tends to be way older. We don't have three-year life cycles. We have very long life cycles, forever if we can get away with it. Because, much like building bridges, who wants to maintain them? Oh, I mean, that's a bad analogy. Um, <laughs> we do maintain OT systems, but only when we take the whole plant down, the whole things down, and eventually we change enough on something that they'll become an economic reason to change. Now I want to address that. Just so nobody thinks that the systems are really old, we have some refineries somewhere around this area, I've been told. I don't know, I've seen a couple bright lights at night. I live out on the far east side right next to a couple. Their productivity today, <coughs> compared to 10 years ago, is not up 1%, 2%, 3%. It's up 30, 40, 50%. Same equipment, okay? Same hardware, same footprint on the ground. Why are they so much more productive? Because they brought computers into the mix to figure out how to change their product, how to change their product cycles. Whereas before I'd run so much of product A, so much product B, so much product C, and then once a week I might change that mix. Today they can change the mix at will because we have computers thinking that for us and setting up recipes and saying that information. So this automation plays a very important role and that's one of the reasons it's now being connected to the internet, because the numbers in and the numbers out really do matter. But at the end of the day, we're still not patching systems. We still don't outsource things. Okay, although we do outsource one thing, which was the design and construction, the initial system. And by the way, most of those people are now long gone. And so we live with what they built and tribal knowledge from passing along. So when we turn around and look at some of these things, they have some advantages we don't have. Physical security. I talked about sitting in the seat. If you want to sit in the control seat that controls one of these plants, you have to get past numerous sets of gates, numerous sets of guards, and then a bunch of big guys who carry wrenches. Okay? And say, I want to sit in that seat. Oh, that's George's seat. <laughs> but I'm going to sit in it today. It doesn't work that way. So they have a physical security advantage over us. They have some other security advantages over us. And if you look at how they originally designed and built their systems, which I'm going to cover here in just a second, they have a huge network advantage over us in IT. Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, from the business side, it's fortunate. By connecting IT and OT, we've achieved tremendous changes in scale and abilities. We've also brought in some interesting outside danger. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We also now have brought a little attention. Um, we've seen some SCADA type or OT networks taken down by adversaries for various reasons. So I want to remind everybody this bottom line right here. In OT, my security is about keeping the system running in a safe position, keep it in the operational guidelines. I would argue that the um, steel mill in Germany that was hacked, that is now one large slab of metal, okay, they attacked us, outside forces attacked a smelter, caused massive damage. Bottom line, pretty much you take a whole lot of molten metal and let it cool on, on top of all your stuff. The good news, all the people left. The bad news, they have a really large chunk of metal that used to be a steel plant and we'll never be a steel plan again. So how do we do it in OT? The same way we've been doing it for decades. Network architecture is everything. They have different network architectures. It is not flat. It is a series of enclaves. Now I use enclaves because that's a term most IT people understand. They use a different language, and this is very, very important. When the OT and the IT people get together, it's Venus and Mars. It's kind of like dating. 
each side thinks they're telling the other side something. They later realize, whoa, that's not what I meant. Okay? In the OT world, we call these things zones. And we connect zones with conduits. So if you walk in, you start talking about, well, this network segment or this enclave, they'll don't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what he's talking about. We walk in and tell him, hey, in this zone, we need to enforce these things at these you know, conduit points. Then they'll understand. The whole purpose behind the network in OT is to limit the number of conversations. Not everything needs to talk to everything. Matter of fact, very few things talk to each other. Generally speaking, you can write on one piece of paper on one side all the conversations in even a large plant. It's a very small list. Limit connections in or conversations, connections, however you want to call it, in or out. The only thing that comes out is one stream of data. And if you're smart, you run through a unidirectional gateway, you don't let anything else come back in that way. And you're not replicating traffic anymore, you're replicating data only, the state. Therefore, what happens? You can't hack that. The numbers come out, but nobody can modify it. You have a very limited number of protocols. They don't need HTTP. There's no reason for that on your network. There's no reason for FTP, mail, streaming of anything, World of Warcraft. Okay, yes, I've seen that in refineries, in control rooms. So, <clears throat> if I build my network correctly, I can monitor easily for exceptions. What I cannot do in a modern IT network, which is look at all the packets and say, oh, that's a bad packet. Why? Encryption, too many conversations, too many protocols. It's too hard to keep up. In an OT network, piece of cake. You can almost do it by hand. Matter of fact, I make my students in class do some of these by hand. Go find the bad packets. Here's a set of PCAP files. The network model is completely different. We use something called a Purdue model. Now, the very top of this model is our enterprise zone, which is your standard IT network. Between your standard IT network and your OT network, there is a double firewall DMZ. Nothing crosses both firewalls. Has to stop in the middle. But if you think about it, what comes in? Occasionally, you're going to send in updates on recipes, files, things like that. And you're going to send data out of the OT system on a regular basis. So you've got like one stream coming in, one stream going out. Not too hard to manage. Once you get inside the control zone, you break it down so that if something goes wrong, the amount of damage is controllable. And here's a good example. A pipeline. We build a pipeline that's 1,000 miles long. You've got controllers on a 1,000 mile stretch of pipe. Do you want them all in the same network zone? So when lightning strikes in Oklahoma and makes one of those little devices lose its smoke, and once the smoke comes out of electronics, they don't talk right, and they just start doing all sorts of odd stuff. So it's sending all sorts of electrical noise and jibber jabber on the network. Do you want that the whole length of that pipeline? I don't. I want to segment it geography-wise into little chunks, just like I do with valves. You don't want a thousand miles of pipe without a valve. Because if something happens somewhere, you have a thousand miles of liquid that has to drain out before you can fix it. So we segment by process, by a whole lot of different factors. So when something goes wrong, we have control over that. Okay? And we segment it not just the length of like a pipeline, but let's look at a manufacturing plant. And I've got one set of conveyors that move things, I've got one that paint things, I've got things that actually um, form metal, all sorts of different things in the plant. Those are different processes. They each have their own zone. Why would I want to mix them? Therefore, if something goes wrong with one part of the plant, the rest of the plant can still run. Underneath it all, and separate, is something called my safety instrument system. This is an independent safety system that monitors the plant. It does not rely upon the control system. Hence the word independent. Because if something goes wrong with the control system, there's an operator looking at a screen whose job, and he gets paid a lot of money to prevent the place from blowing up. 
But should something happen, and his screen doesn't show it, before it blows up, an independent system should always be looking and saying, you know, that pressure is higher than it's supposed to be. Let's do something about that. Now, how do IT people look at this? Well, that safety stuff, let's just combine that for cost effectiveness into virtual machines onto the same platform. <laughs> have we ever, server consolidation, anyone? Ever have a problem with that? No, nah, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. And all those different zones, man, those bits have to go through so many different firewalls, so many different devices. Let's make the network flat, all those problems go away. Until, of course, somewhere in Nebraska, something goes wrong, and then Texas doesn't work. <laughs> so, one of the things that the engineers did when they first built this stuff is they decided who needs to talk to each other. They just didn't go throw a bunch of equipment out into a plant and say, hey, you guys, go figure it out. They actually built it in such a way that one piece of equipment talks to only one other piece of equipment. HMI, the human machine interface, reflects what all these different devices have. So it sees from a whole bunch of devices. But those whole bunch of field devices don't talk to each other because they don't need to. Matter of fact, you don't want them to. Okay? So if everybody's not talking to everybody, what happens? Whenever you have a signal that doesn't match one of these defined little short list of signals, what is it? It's a problem. Now what happens when someone attacks your network, your corporate network? They get in using Tom's credentials. Once they get in using Tom's credentials, they traverse the network, looking at things, checking things out, trying different things, and failing. But do we ever see all those little failures? Only they're dumb about it. If they try something that doesn't work, they don't try it with a script 100 million times. They just move on. They're constantly doing these things until so they find the holes, they find the vulnerable boxes. Can you see this traffic in your busy IT networks? Not a chance. Matter of fact, even after the fact, sometimes it's hard to go back and find the friends of markers and things. In the OT network, where you have maybe 30 or 50 set conversations and anything that doesn't match one of those is an anomaly, the first time they try to touch any device, it's going to stand out and say, hey, this doesn't look like any of these others. So I can actually use this to very quickly decide, I know who's supposed to be talking to whom, okay? Kind of like grade school. If I see two people passing a note, like right now, I can call them on it. Hey, you two boxes aren't supposed to talk to each other. So even if you come in and spoof your signals and say, well, I'm really this device, it's going to stand out. Now, one of the things everybody says, well, you can't figure out everything has to come in, it has to go out, all these things. Yeah, we can. In the, in the IT world, no. But in the OT world, the number of things coming out, it's the historian sends its data out. That's it. There's nothing else. There's no need. If it's not in a historian data stream, it's not real. Okay, the historian is a magic database that stores everything that's happened. Coming in. I already defined what things I'm going to accept coming in, and no, it's not updates. Because I'm not going to be able to patch most of the stuff anyway. And if I do need to bring in an update, there's a very defined method by which it comes in. And I'll be expecting it. I'll know when it's showing up. The operator will know this file is going to show up at this time for this purpose. Anything out of that, I just block ruthlessly. So if I let the architecture of the network do all this work for me, can you bypass that? Not really. And if you do figure out how to bypass it, what happens? You're instantly seen by anybody watching. Then we bring in this one problem, outside vendors. Anybody here flown on a jet engine lately, or an aircraft lately with a jet engine? How would you feel if that jet engine was in constant contact, even when flying with the manufacturer? Would that bother you? Because if so, it'll be a lot easier for me flying in the future because you guys won't be flying. <laughs> every major jet aircraft manufacturer, every major turbine manufacturer monitors turbines for vibration. Because vibration kills turbines. Okay? And you can see it way before it's dangerous. 
But if you don't do something about it, it rapidly destroys a piece of equipment. So they're all monitored all the time. So the vendor says, hey, I'm not going to warrant your stuff unless you let us look at it. When you're talking million dollar assets, the warnings kind of matter. Hence, you let them monitor. And they use a VPN. VPNs are magic. Okay? Because if I put traffic in a VPN, it is secure, correct? Do I, how many people think it's secure? Nobody? Then why do we use VPNs? Anybody here ever use a VPN? See? So I like that, better than nothing, etc. Okay, what VPNs do is they prevent what's inside from talking to what's outside, and what's outside from talking to what's inside, basically. Simply put, a VPN is like me taking my laptop directly into the control room itself and just plugging it in. I don't have to be somewhere else. I can just walk right in. Now, who's going to allow any vendor to bring in their one of their sales reps or their tech reps' laptop or their computer directly into your system and just plug it right straight into your network? Didn't think so. Hence, what a VPN does, which is just that, is it really magic? Is it really useful? Okay. So VPNs, we have this magic aura. When people we talk about, they're like, well, but it's in the VPN, it's okay. No, it's not. Being in the VPN means you just invited it and everybody else it has ever been with directly in your network. ICS CERT more than once has called companies and said, <clears throat> your vendor, specifically this machine on this salesman or this field text, it's infected with XYZ. Why do we know? Because on this day he was here, on this day he was here, on this day he was there, on this day he was here. And it took us a couple weeks to talk to all these companies and figure out who the common person is. You need to tell the guy to quit plugging his laptop in. Because everywhere he goes, he's taking presents. Now, does this happen once? Oh, way more than once. Okay? Now, did he actually bring the laptop into the plant? No, he VPN, so it's okay. Okay? I'm going to say one graphic thing that will remind you all about this. You remember this forever. Look at a VPN like a condom. If you're both inside, you're using it wrong. <laughs> but that's how we look at that. You won't ever forget VPNs now, will you? <laughs> and they're not magic. They just literally aren't. So now, how do I want architect in success in today's world? I'm going to connect OT to IT. There are a couple things I have to do here, and I have to do it right. I have to isolate the enterprise from the OT system. But I need to do it with the same tool I've always used, firewalls. But how do I do it? I limit it to very specific conversations, i.e. from one machine to one machine. And that's it. And if I'm really nervous about it, I use something called a unidirectional gateway is my connector. The unidirectional gateway is a device that takes in network traffic on one side, converts the information from the traffic into a state. Think of this like computer science, the actual state. Here's the data sends that data over a light link that only goes one way because there's no back path. Okay, an LED sends it that way and the receiver sees it. Converts it back on the other machine, on a different machine, takes the data that it received and turns it into a packet and then sends that packet on. It does not send any of the flags, any of the other things. It does not pass traffic. It is not a data diode. It is not a next generation firewall. It does not pass traffic whatsoever. Now, will this pass TCP? Pop quiz, can it pass TCP? No, that's traffic. Can it pass UDP? No, that's traffic still. It can only pass contents, contents that map a certain way. Therefore, you can't break it. <coughs> If something goes wrong on either end, it just corrupts the computer on the end and it stops working. Doesn't send bad stuff, can't do that. So I have ways of limiting my ins and outs. Now, VPNs, I'm gonna have to have VPNs because the vendors are gonna have to have the ability to get in. 
But I didn't say the vendor has to have the ability to connect his laptop directly to my turbine. If you look at a jet engine, the laptop is never, the vendor never connects directly to the turbine itself. The turbine connects to a computer inside the aircraft. The aircraft has a transponder to a satellite. That transponder sends the data to a satellite, the satellite sends it to the ground station, etc. There is no back door back way in. It's very similar to unidirectional gateway. So if I need to do it in a place where the vendor has to send stuff in, use a jump host. Actually build a system inside your plant that looks just like theirs that you've controlled and you know it's safe and they can VPN into it, i.e. use it like a remote desktop and they can move the mouse around on your computer and make your computer do what they think they're doing. Okay? Bottom line though, at all times we should know who's using what channels. Because what happens if somebody's using the VPN at 3 o'clock in the morning and it's not our vendor? Well, my question is, why is it even turned on? If the vendor's not, if the vendor's not going to be using it, turn it off. It doesn't have to be turned on. We can look at the past and learn a lot. The OT world does. They pay attention to the past. The past didn't break. We're not changing the future. Okay? What did we learn from Ukraine? Flat networks don't work in OT systems. Ukraine had a flat network. Ukraine never looked at their VPN. They never looked at who was coming in. The adversary in Ukraine spent nine months poking around trying things. How do we know this? Well, they attacked more than the number of systems that went down. I can't give exact details for a lot of reasons, except to say, on at least one system, they made a mistake. And killed this was killed before it ran leaving all the data. So various parties were able to go in, we could gather the data, we could look at the systems and find, oh, this is how it's going to work. Oh, this is how they're doing it. Had that kill disk successfully operated, we would still today wonder, don't know how they did it. The artifacts out of Ukraine came from a machine that was a mistake, not from one of the machines that was hit correctly. The machines that were hit correctly were completely destroyed. There was no, nothing left to look at. Sony. How many times was Sony violated? Okay, so when you want to scan on your high horse and say, Sony was actually hit very hard by hackers three times. And only the third time did, it work, did they actually get their act together, right? I'll believe that when five years go by and it hasn't happened again. I still don't think they're taking it seriously on a lot of their fronts. Target. What's the lesson we learned from Target? What was the, how did they get into Target? They went through an HVAC vendor. Now, I'm just, okay, we all have interconnected systems, but how do packets get from my HVAC vendor and control systems into my point of sale? Are there any PCI DSS people here? Maybe you can point that path. Okay? So, <clears throat> All these people should have seen it coming, and yet none of them had a chance. Why? Because they weren't looking. At the end of the day, one of the amazing things about OT systems, they're much more securable than IT, because they have a very limited number of conversations, I have a very defined network, I have a very defined workspace, and anything I see that's outside of that would be bad. All I do is look. I spent 10 years in the military. One of the things we did in the military were guard various things. Okay? If you've ever had special weapons, and you'll understand what that means if you've been in the military, you guard them differently than you do anything else. And one of the things you do all the time is have at least two people watching them at all times. Never one person. And they're never, never watched. Why? Because security is something that really matters. And watching does stop a lot of things. And the watchers didn't say, ah, oh, well, we saw George kind of hanging around and he probably shouldn't have been there. No. Anything goes out of the ordinary, they immediately stop and fix it. What are our challenges? Our challenges are really simple. And the first one and the only one is up there, and it's really it. It's people. <clears throat> people operate IT. People operate OT. 
different people operate IT and OT. And so they have different languages. We have to figure out how to get them to talk to each other. And not adopt a common language, but embrace and understand the other's languages. What we do in OT would never work in IT. And I would never stand up here and try to sell that. But I'm also not going to say, I'm not going to be sold on, oh, well, you think you're really good at IT, so therefore it's going to work in OT? I have a different objective. If you can tell me your IT security meets my security objective, I'm going to say you have crappy IT security because you're not achieving your objective, you're achieving my objective. And they're different. We have different values. Completely different values on how we trust, how we use, who does what. We have different experiences. One of the things about OT, why they never change anything? Because they remember the last time they did. They remember the last failure, and nobody wants to talk about the last failures. They're very sensitive to that. It is very expensive when things go wrong. Now, do things go wrong all the time? I'm researching something for a grant I'm on with the Department of Energy, and one of the questions I have, how many pipeline incidents really are there? Don't go Google that. It will scare you. You will no longer like pipelines. There are a lot of them. However, most of them, when you really dig to the bottom of it, aren't near as bad as they could have been. Why? Because their systems all work the way they're supposed to, to limit the damage, limit the harm. Whereas the IT world, if we adopt their principles, how do we know a pipeline blew up? Because when we went home and saw it on CNN, we go, hey, that's one of ours. <laughs> Maybe we should call the IT people that are out there. Okay? So, in the end of the day, we're all one company, we're all one team. There's, I don't know of an OT group anywhere that doesn't have an IT group. Okay, because if you had OT without IT, then it'd be a very boring place. Plus the fact when you have that separate network machine for your weather. By the way, in control rooms, we really care about weather in a lot of cases, so we build a PC solely to look at weather and play World of Warcraft. And <coughs> weather. Yeah. IT makes that machine work for us. It's on their network, not on ours. <laughs> So, whose rules are we going to play by? On the weather machine, okay, we'll play by IT rules. On the human machine interface that actually decides whether the machine blows up, doesn't blow up, whether it stops making product, we're going to play by OT rules. That's an important thing. Now, I have room for questions, but first I want to do a quick little advertising of my own. I passed some of these out. I am at the University of Houston. We have a master's program in security. If you didn't get one of these, because I just only got so far in passing them out, I didn't give everybody here one. I have a stack up here. So you can feel free to get some. Did you want one? We, we can even get you a stop. That's a lot. Yeah. So feel free to ask for these later if you have information or want to know about our programs. That's my sales pitch. I'm open for questions. Anyone have questions for Dr. Conklin? So, uh, Dr. Conklin, is there any way to make the VPN secure? The answer is, is there any way to make a VPN secure? Well, first we have to define what secure means. And if I want to make a VPN, so that people outside the VPN can't see what's going on inside, then the answer is yes. But if I want to make the VPN act as a security device against the person inside the VPN, never. It's not designed to do that. It acts as a wall between, you're basically letting the person inside the VPN in your network. You got one. VPN is as good as its crypto implementation with the algorithm, right? Like, so it's okay, the, the, the question or the comment is the VPN is as good as its crypto algorithms implementation. Yes and no. 
a VPN against an out somebody outside the VPN, seeing what's going on inside the VPN. That's pretty close to correct, although actually there are ways of looking at encrypted traffic and determining based on encrypted traffic who's talking to whom and how much and where. So it's not, you may not know what they're talking about, but you'll certainly know if they're talking. But again, it comes back to the best crypto in the world doesn't help if you're connecting a bad machine on the inside. Any other questions? Yes. So basically, I think what I'm hearing is through the VPN or through any connection of any machine, if there is any type of malware, anything like that, it can infect your systems. As soon as you connect to any machine, from machine A to machine B via network with nothing interceding between them, mm -hmm. any traffic, including bad traffic, can flow between them. Okay. So the VPN, all it does is make it so somebody on the outside can pretend they're on the inside. And it keeps you from the outside and watching what's happening, but it does nothing to protect against that machine. You can have machine A in the vendor's hand VPN into machine B in your network. And of course, you can infect your machine B. But that's okay, because that machine's not connected to your network. It's connected to a VPN endpoint. And that machine has the ability to RDP, or in other means, control another machine in your network. Well, that's not a network connection anymore. Can that be bridged by certain pieces of malware and things? Yes, but it's really, really hard. And it's really easy to see when it happens. And so by using jump hosts, you can block that. By the way, I didn't mention air gaps. Everybody's like, well, let's just air gap it. Just to bring up a little point, Stuxnet went across multiple air gaps and did a very good job. Air gaps don't really exist. Do you have another question? Um, yes, so what kind of uh, security risks are involved uh, during operational shutdowns? What kind of security risks are involved with operational technology during shutdowns like we were talking about earlier? Well, okay, I'm operating my system and I'm going to shut it down. What sort of risks are there? The same risks when operating. We have shutdown procedures just like we have startup procedures, normal operating procedures. The biggest problem is once I've shut it down, any changes I make, I no longer know what the system really looks like or how it works. And I need to validate those changes. That's why we never just hop in and floor it. Okay? Anybody here ever ride a bicycle and decide to see how fast you're going down a big hill and then realize I probably should check the brakes before I got halfway down the hill? Okay? When you're running a large plant or a manufacturing plant or any of those sorts of things, yet you spend a lot of time testing everything, bringing it up before. So that's the operational risk. And, uh, actual operations done to ameliorate any problems or identify them before they'll bite you. That's why it takes weeks to start these things. So we hear the power grid is always unsecure. Is that the IT side saying it's unsecure and you're saying because of OT, SCADA and, and the way you guys operate, it actually is secure? Every networked system is insecure, even OT systems. The question is, when are they insecure and from what? And in a case like our electric grid, it's not one thing. We have the bulk power system that's regulated by NERC and FERC and uses something called NERC SIP to quote unquote protect it. It is vulnerable, we know that. It has problems, but they're doing things to try to address those problems. That's not the whole electric grid. The last mile, so to speak, from your substation to your house, what was attacked in Ukraine would not even been covered by an set. So now you're up to whatever the companies want to provide for security. My bottom line on answering any of these is when the NSA freely admits, and they do, that even on their most classified networks, they do not own all the traffic on their own networks. They know their foreign adversaries in their networks at all times. 
So, can you conduct business safely and securely under the circumstances? If you go into it knowing that, understanding that, the answer is yes. And so, is it insecure? Yes. But can it be operated in a secure fashion? Yes. It just takes extra work. It's not free. So let's thank Dr. Conklin.